So we're going to move uh, today from the uh, Greek period to the Roman period, looking at Virgil's Aeneid. Hope you've had a great, good break, by the way, and got a chance to uh, finish your essays. Once again, I said last class, please send me an electronic copy of your essay. I wanted the, the burnt offering up front as well, but I burnt them, so I need an e-copy. <laughs> Not really, but, um, but an e-copy I would like. So please, if you haven't sent me one, please send me an e-copy. Yes? Email is good, ideal. Yes, please. Um, so we're moving on by quite a few hundred years, actually. We left off with, oh, yes, question. Um, do you have a preferred format, PDF or DOC? Either, okay. yeah. As long as I can comment on it, then that's good, yes. Um, moving on for about 400 years. So we've moved from Sophocles uh, to the Roman period. And in the interim, a lot has happened, really, uh, in terms of Western history that I don't really cover on this course, but I'll just throw it in the background, much of which you know already. But um, Alexander the Great, um, the student of Aristotle, who was the student of Plato, um, went throughout the whole known world and conquered civilizations wherever he went. And he wept when there was no more worlds to conquer, basically. Went all the way to India. And with him left a trail of uh, civilizations that bear the mark of Alexander. Founded over 70 cities, one of them being the famous library in um, Egypt known as Alexandria, so named after him. Lots of cities named after Alexander all over the place. With that, transmits Gre Greece, uh, Greek culture, and the Greek language as the language of the literate um, everywhere he goes. So even when, they, uh, when Alexander dies and his four sons split up his empire, divide it in four, um, Greek is still a common tongue, and the inheritance, the paideia, the reverence for the Greek epics, for Greek um, education uh, in the realms of philosophy, etc., they go with it. So politically, they're a spent force. In terms of ideas, they're not. And the educated people of the Roman period will also be schooled in Greek literature and Greek learning. And the, the Romans, for their part, uh, don't seek to uh, improve upon the Greeks because they don't think that they can really. They regard the Greeks as their superiors in this one area. The, Romans will not give ground to them in terms of other things, in terms of their laws and in terms of their permanence. Um, but there is a brilliance to Greek, the Greek culture which they acknowledge. And many of the teachers of the Ro great Romans that you will know historically were just Greek slaves. So these were teachers enslaved by the Romans, but since they are renowned for education, we'll use those Greek slaves to teach our own children. That's what happens. And um, what we can say for sure in the Aeneid is that we have another epic. We've already looked at one epic in the Odyssey, and I mentioned the Iliad um, as the foregoing epic. So the Battle of Troy was uh, in the Iliad. The return from the Battle of Troy is the uh, Odyssey. And Virgil, in the midst of the Roman Empire, as it is now, so this is another thing, okay. So the the Greek culture is spread out through the Rome known world, but in the interim, and over the two centuries leading up to Virgil, Rome has been spreading, and it's spreading against other political foes, potentially at any rate, and the main one is in North Africa, Carthage. So let me put a, model, a map up here. Let's see if I can do that. Map of Rome and Carthage. I don't know what this timeline is. Yeah, it'll work. Oops. A little too much. Can you see that? You can see that. Oh, go away. It's inappropriate. Thank you. Go away. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to die. It's so bad. 
I want all these clicking things to go away. There. It still has the ad closed by Google. OK, so this is, nope. As soon as I shrink it, it goes too small. All right, so you can't, you're not going to be able to do anything about this. This is Rome in green. And in orange, we have the Carthaginian territories, so which you can see is all over North Africa in that area called Numidia, historically, and up into the south of Spain. New Carthage, grounded here. Carthage itself, which is here. And then it extends all the way uh, east over here. But it is a part of Sicily, Sardinia, Corsica. So these islands and the ba Balearic Islands here uh, off the east coast of Spain. And then the Romans. So there is a battle royale going on in this period between the Carthaginians and the Romans, which is the backdrop for this story of the Aeneid. And so in between Greece and the Roman Empire, we have the Roman, the, found, the story of the founding of Rome, the establishment of the Roman Republic against its one competitor, which is Carthage, and the backstory to that. And the backstory to that, interestingly, connects us so far as to go back to Troy again, which is very interesting. So both sides, the Romans on the one hand and the Carthaginians on the other, go back to Troy again. So I talked about the significance of Troy. And the, I mentioned in the first class in the 16th, 17th, 18th, even into the 19th century, some question whether Troy even existed. It was just a myth. Because the, the city, although it's mentioned in, even in the Bible, nobody can find the ruins of it. It's, not, it's supposed to be on, on the water. And it's upland because the water is retreated. So, but they discover it in the 19th century and find actually there was a Troy. There are, there's archaeological evidence of a battle there and so forth. So it's a, it's a true story, which is passed into myth and legend, but the legends are based on truth. There's some, something that happened at some point. And more important than the battle is the stories that were passed on about it and the identities of the people that arose from it. And so we've seen that the Greeks identify with this. It's connected with the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, now we're going to find that the Romans will also identify with it. Because the Romans are the, the defeated foes from Troy. Where do they go after they lose the, the Trojan War? You might think they're just gone. That's not the story that Virgil's going to tell us. Virgil's story is that while the Greeks went back to Greece, the Trojans wandered themselves and founded the Roman uh, Republic eventually. But they first landed in the place called Carthage and eventually made their way back to Rome. I'm going to get a better map of this, because I would like one that's not so small you can't see it. That's good enough. That's a little better. Can I blow that up at all? Yes. That's a little better. But what you can't see here is that the wanderings, and maybe I can put that on here. Let me see this, the wanderings of Aeneas. Where's map? Images? There you go. As you can see, he begins in Troy, goes up to Thrace, comes down to Crete, lands over here, Etna, Sicily, ends up in Carthage. That's where we're going to meet him at the beginning. We're going to, he's going to deal with the, in books one and two, he's going to deal with the fall of Troy and escaping the fall of Troy, and then he's going to wander himself, end up in Carthage for a while. That'll be dealt with in book four. And then he'll eventually go down into the underworld and come up out of it, and then go to Italy. Oh, the ad again. Brutal. To Latium, from which we get the word Latin. It's an area in Italy. It's where they get the Latin tongue. And the, the story that he tells is going to be very much like Homer's story. Remember, Homer's story is the Iliad, which is a battle for 24 books. And then the Odyssey, which is the wanderings of Odysseus home, 24 books. All together, a battle and then a wandering. This is the exact other way around. It begins with the wanderings for six books and then a battle for six books. So in other words, it's, it's tipping the cap to Homer 
and, and making itself a parallel. It's drawing a, a, a comparison. This is how literature works. Good literature exists not in a vacuum uh, in, without context. It exists in relation to things that have been said, great things of old, which we know and are passing on. And we're uh, connecting to that. Scripture works this way, by the way, as well. The story in gen told in Genesis is um, related to repeatedly by later writers. Genesis 1 to 3 is the foundation stone for the rest of Scripture. It speaks about the, the seed of the woman crushing the head of the serpent. Well, that's Christ. Amplified in the book of Revelation, it blows it up in, in large in Revelation 12. Look at Revelation 12. It talks about the dragon and the beast and the dragon and the, and the woman and the child. Again, reference to uh, Christ and, uh, and Satan and so forth. Different ways, different iterations. So uh, all literature, including the Bible, tends to make back references that it assumes that its audience already knows when it's telling its story. So stories don't exist in a vacuum. They require you to know the old stories to appreciate the new stories, which is one of the reasons why we begin with the Greeks here at Tyndale. Because this story that's told here will also be known by the Jews and the Romans and the Greeks in the time of Christ. They will know this story because it's part of Roman culture and it's part of Greek culture. It's deep myth and legend. And it's foundational because in this case, the story of the Aeneid is the story of how the Roman people came into existence. And how did they come into existence? Well, they left Troy via Carthage and went to Italy and then fought battles against the indigenous peoples of Italy to found the city of Rome, which is nothing like what it is even in their day at this time, but still it's the early beginnings of it. So it's the, it's the rise of a new civilization. That's what we're dealing with. And in the epic, I said to you, an epic is not just a long narrative poem. It's, it has a, an encyclopedic aspect. It tells the whole story of a people, everything of significance. It'll talk to us about the gods. It'll talk to us about the underworld. It'll talk to us about the afterlife. It'll talk to us about history. And it'll talk to us about the future, even. It's going to prophesy about what goes on forward. What will, so it, it's really to, total. It has this grand worldview in the same way that scripture does. So in that sense, scripture can be said to be epic in its scope. It's, it's a grand scope. It also has a hero. The hero here is Aeneas. He's, um, I'll, I'll talk more about his character and compare him to Odysseus and maybe uh, to um, Achilles as well, because they are quite different. And yet he, it does have a hero. And it also begins in the middle of things. Did I mention that in relation to an epic? An epic always begins in the middle of the story. Doesn't right begin at the, it doesn't begin at the beginning. It begins in the middle of the story. Remember that the Odyssey began with Telemachus back in Ithaca and then gave us a backstory of how we got to have a 20-year-old sitting in uh, his father's disrupted kingdom, lamenting, not knowing where his father was. That's how the story begins. It begins with human tragedy on a domestic level, and then only backtracks to find out what has happened to the hero in the, in the intervening 20 years of this man's life. And then it telescopes forward. So it begins in the middle of things, goes back, and then only then goes forward. Remember, it goes forwards from book 13 onwards. Odysseus comes back to Ithaca. And then we get the story going forward. But everything up to that point is, uh, is contemporary, backstory, then forward. Epics are all written like this. They follow this pattern. And, and it, in some sense, it works this way in other genres as well, like crime stories. You usually begin with the scene of the crime at the beginning. If you've ever watched CGI and so forth, there's usually some sort of event. Somebody's dead. And then they tell you what happened before that leading up to it. And usually the detective has to give you the clues that led to that, up to that event. And then they go forward and try and find the person who did this based on the evidence and so forth. This is not doing the same thing. It, it's not trying to find clues about what happened in the past. It knows what happened in the past. 
it just defers what happened in the past till um, it's got to the point of challenge. It's just a technique. So it begins in the middle of things, and the other thing it does is it begins with an invocation of the muse. Now you'll recall that I said that there were nine muses in the ancient world for the arts, and the muses were divine, and they were the goddesses of uh, a mother whose name was Nemosune, which means memory. So, so were the, they were the nine daughters of the goddess memory. And one of them is an epic muse. There's also a tragic muse, and there's a lyric muse, and so forth. This is not, uh, so when the poet appeals to the muse, he's asking to remember what's happened, to tell his story. Now, the reason I say this is post 18th century, so this means us, we no longer appeal to our memories, our cultural memories, the wisdom of the past, the stories of old, the counsel of wisdom of the nations before, the appeal to the church, the appeal to authorities. It calls upon the genius of the artist to produce something new and inventive and creative. That's what we expect from poets or from novelists or from uh, filmmakers. We want to be dazzled by the inventiveness the originality of the author. In fact, we appeal to the, the, the originality of the author. Like a really good writer, that was so, wasn't that amazing? I had no idea what was going to happen. In this world, they don't care for originality. They don't care at all. They're telling a story which every person in Rome already knows. Every person in Greece already knows the story of Thebes and Oedipus. Remember, he's in Homer's underworld. He's a famous figure. They already know the horrible story there. But it's the telling of the story and the appeal to memory. And memory is connecting us to the past. So there's something about the epic which gives credibility to the importance of the grand scope of human experience. So your generation, just like my generation, is not the first generation to walk the earth. We don't have the sum and substance of wisdom. We don't know better than our parents. We are subject to the same frailties of human nature as they were. We think we can see the deficiencies in our parents' point of view, which we can. But what we don't see is the deficiencies of our own point of view, because we simply don't. It's called the speck in the, the log. We see this, the log in our parents' eyes or generations past. We see those as big logs. Like that's, not, that's a log jam. That's not a log. We see it in technical or big, big problems in the past, we don't see anything wrong with us. Well, that's because we're myopic. Because we've got one eye, we're like the Cyclops. We think that being civilized means living in the midst of nature, deciding on our own what's right and wrong, right? With the portrait that the Greeks show uh, of a, an absolutely uncivilized people, that's our model of good living. Doing what's right in our own eye, not eyes. So it's worse than the judges, one eye. Um, the Romans and the Greeks, and for that matter, the peoples of scripture, had a different view. They thought that uh, the wise that lived before them had something to teach them. And they were, in a sense, when they read what they said, they were their contemporaries. They were alongside. So let's come alongside Homer. Let's come alongside Virgil, just like we'll come alongside scripture. Let's reason together. Let's look at how God looks at things in scripture. Right? I'm not just going to trust my own mind. Because again, Romans 12, verse 2, we're no longer to be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of our mind. So how do you do that? Well, by, not, by, by taking a step back and looking at it through somebody else's eyes. In this case, it's Virgil. And Virgil is very different um, I, from Homer. Although, as I said, he immediately tips the cap to Homer by putting an Odyssey and an Iliad in his own epic. He also does it by appealing in the very first line to Homer's two epics. I sing of arms and the man. Arms, the Iliad, the man, the Odyssey, the two epics invoked in the one line. Already we have another dimension of an epic that I haven't mentioned thus far, which is that s later epics seek to uh, not only refer to past epics, but to build on them and to some degree to outdo them. 
Virgil, for all of his reverence of Homer, believes that his epic is greater than Homer's. Only in one sense, Rome is greater. Not that Virgil himself is greater, but, the, but Rome is. Virgil, or rather Homer, wrote about, you know, people in this little area that were dotted around in cities like Athens and, and Sparta over here and Corinth up here and so forth. But these were relatively small people. They didn't last very long. Rome is a civilization now that encompasses the whole of the known world. So that map I showed you of uh, Rome versus Carthage, uh, this is not the map of Virgil's day because this is when there are two rivals around the Mediterranean. By the time Virgil writes his epic, Carthage is gone. It's been defeated. And everything that is read here will be the entire map of the known world. It's the time when Jesus comes into the world. This is the additional subject of interest. The literate language of the day is Greek, which is why the New Testament is written in Greece, because all the literate people, they're not writing in Roman, they're writing in Greek. And the authors of scripture are writing in Greek. And at the same time, the political scene is that Rome rules everything, including Israel, the old Israel that's gone. It's under a Roman occupation. Everywhere is under Roman occupation. Rome is everywhere. And so with that comes the Roman civilization. So I, I don't want to get sidetracked and talk about the, uh, the sort of seedbed for Christianity, but it is, there is a political peace that has come over the known world. We, we're aware of the hostility towards the Jewish people in the Roman times, because they're under occupation. They're not happy about it. Yes, but there are no wars in Rome. Rome has conquered all of its enemies. They're all defeated. So there's the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. This is the context for the time when Virgil writes the Aeneid. And we're moving, and at the same time, which this sounds very positive, who doesn't want peace? There's something that's lurking that's very insidious here that I think Virgil's well aware of, and that is we've moved from a republic to an empire. You'll know about this from Star Wars, the Republic versus the Empire. These are all riffs and points to the Roman context, but we're dealing with the fall of the Republic and the rise of the Empire. So although Augustus Caesar, who by the way is Virgil's patron, he commissions this work to talk about the glory of Rome and the glory of a Roman Empire that encompasses the whole known world, and as far as we can tell, will have no rivals because it's defeated all of its rivals and will last eternally, the eternal city of Rome. Um, Virgil's a little bit critical of that. And the reason he's critical of it because he sees in empire something that is at odds with the very spirit of free peoples. Empire means tyranny. Empire is, does not mean liberty. Empire does not mean anything like what we would call democracy. There is no freedom of thought, there's no freedom of speech, there's no freedom to criticize. Not really. Once you get imperial Rome, the Caesars will put down their opponents and insist that everybody bow the knee to Caesar. Caesar as the representation of God on earth. Right? You have to t take a pinch of incense and throw it on the fire and swear allegiance to Caesar as a god which the Christians will not do, by the way, for which they're called atheists. Not because they deny God, but they deny all the gods. They say there's only one God. They're, they're called atheists by the Romans in the day. The funny old thing, it's sort of shocking. What do you mean? They're, Christians are all about worshiping Jesus. Yes, but they denied that any of the other gods were gods, and especially, and this is, this is the, the litmus test, they deny that Caesar is Lord, which is what he claims. They say Caesar is Lord, and they say Jesus is Lord, and it's a deliberate echo of what the Roman emperors are saying. So the New Testament adds another dimension to this. There's a theological dimension here, which is at work in the rise of the empire, and it's that Caesar claims divinity. And our man Virgil is also a critic of this, 
which is interesting. He doesn't do it as a Christian. He does it as a Roman. And his, he does it against the backdrop of his friendship with Augustus Caesar, who, as I say, commissions the work. Um, so many parallels with Homer. As I say, it combines a bit of both uh, epics. Anyone comments or questions here so far, by the way, before I get back to the text? Just setting the stage here. Yes. Uh, the pedantic meter like, of uh, an epic, is that like, relevant like, to the spoken part as well? It is. So the, uh, again, the translations can't really pick up this. It's written in hexameter, which is six feet. Um, dactylic hexameter, uh, and it is the same style as Homer. So we'll add that to the mix as well. He's writing it in the same meter as Homer. You can do this in Roman, you know, in, uh, in uh, Latin, as you can in Greek. It doesn't work in English. You can write a dactylic hexameter, but you can't really keep the content in the same way. So later poets don't even bother. They don't try. They write it in meter, but they're not going to replicate it to the point of dactylic hexameter. But it is written in dactylic hexameter, same meter as Homer. So if we didn't know, I mean, that alone would tell us that it was an epic. So whenever a poet writes in dactylic hexameter, everyone thinks epic. Immediately, they can hear the cadence in their heads. Um, now, I will say, although Homer is greater than Virgil, Virgil's more important than Homer. And there are two reasons for that. Uh, one is the subsequent context. It's not because the Roman Empire was considered by subsequent generations to be greater. It's because the language of the church as it arose in the West was Latin. And Virgil's Latin is so good and so beautiful that it was used as a manual, a style manual for, uh, for students. You would read Virgil to become a good writer in Latin. And if you think this is irrelevant, uh, Luther and Calvin would have learned this, and so would Wesley. They would have learned the Latin. And they wouldn't have learned to translate Latin into English, only they would have taken their English translation and written them in Latin as well. Same all the way through the mid-19th century, by the way. It was an expectation. In, in Oxford, in Harvard, in Princeton, in Cambridge, all the major universities, the language of the literate was Latin. They wrote in Latin, in the vernacular as well. I just want to show you the, the, the length of the legacy. Homer remain, or Virgil remains important because he is uh, the language of the literate, but also he's accepted by the church. Let me add something to that. Um, I'm going to add it when I come to Dante. I'll, I'll deal with the excerpt. But there's an excerpt from one of Virgil's other poems called the Eclogues in which he looks like he's prophesying the coming of Christ. It sounds like Isaiah. And the church saw that Virgil was a sort of a secular prophet. He didn't know that it was referring to Christ, but he was referring to Christ, they thought. And so this added a little bit uh, to the legend surrounding Virgil himself. Not just a great stylist, but in some ways had a, a, a secret awareness or God spoke through him, even though he was oblivious to it. So this is very interesting. Um, what, do, what more do I want to say about this? Do I need to set a stage for a backdrop? A, a little bit. I, so I mentioned the Republic of Rome. So it begins, the early stages are not a republic. They're of um, uh, kings. The early Roman period is marked by kings. But then there's a republican period, which is a golden age for Rome, basically. When the Senate is uh, speaking uh, and, and power is shared and, and the arts flourish. And that happens and goes all the way up to the time of Julius Caesar, whom you've heard of the man who gets stabbed on the Capitoline Hill by his friends, Marcus Brutus and others. Um, and that begins a period of civil war. So Julius Caesar, and why? Because he was suggesting that he was going to become an emperor. There were little hints that the great military commander Julius Caesar was not 
going to be satisfied with being just one of the great people in Rome. He wanted to be the man. And so he was stabbed by the defenders of the Republic. And from that, as I say, a civil war breaks out. Uh, three parties there. One of them is this man, Augustus Caesar, the patron for this work. His name was Octavian at the time. He was Julius Caesar's adopted son. I'm throwing a lot at you, I realize that. Julius Caesar adopted this young man as his son. Now, let just I'll say one final thing about that. In this age, being the legitimate offspring of a father and a mother was not the most important thing. The most important thing is that they adopted you when you reached a certain age. You became the heir. They gave you uh, the, the equivalent of a laying on of hands. Now you're my son. In Rome, until the father did this, his offspring, legitimate firstborn, second, doesn't matter, could be set aside, killed, exiled, whatever, at any point. If you upset dad, you're out. You're, you're not legitimate. You're not the heir. It doesn't matter if you're the firstborn. And the, and the Roman state basically let fathers have this power. It's called the pater famili familias. Roman law allowed the father total reign within his household. He, he was a tyrant over his wife and children until he adopted an heir. And the heir could be anybody he wanted. And in this case, Julius adopted this man, uh, Octavian, because he regarded him as so brilliant that he wanted to pass on his name through him. So he became Octavius, uh, or he, re he changed his name to Augustus, which is the great. Augustus means the great. In other words, Caesar the great. This is not irrelevant to the story because within the story of the Aeneid, the hero Aeneas has a son and his name is Julius, Julius, the great ancestor of Julius Caesar. And so he is not by natural birth, but by association in the family of, of, of the founder of Rome, and he's telling the story of Octavius. It goes all the way back to the beginning. How long does his lineage go back? It goes back to the founding of Rome itself. So how great is his, like in our culture, it's hard to come up with a, a uh, common reference, uh, a great figure of the past. In the US, it doesn't last very long, like the Kennedys, if you got a Kennedy name. In India, the Gandhi name. In Canada, oh, the Trudeau name. You know, it's a name. It's a name. It has certain political cachet. In this case, it doesn't go back to the 60s or the 70s. It goes back to ancient history. It's an ancient name. Everybody knows this name. And with the name comes political power great political power and authority because there's some like you're, one of the originals early noble bloodline that has played through to this day so when he writes about this he's going to insert Julius and so I want you to note when you're reading this watch not only Julius or rather Aeneas watch his son and what Virgil says in relation to his son it's very important it's why he leaves Troy by the way to, to save his son not himself, not his wife. He, he wants to fight and die, by the way, in Troy. But he does it for the sake of his son. Note at the beginning, it's going to tell, and this is the invocation of the muse, I mentioned this. He tells the whole story, gives the whole story away right at the beginning, in the invocation of the muse. Um, rather than read this one, I'll read the one that's on the screen since it's in front of you. I sing of arms and the man, he who, exiled by fate, first came from this coast of Troy to Italy and to Lavinian shores, hurled about endlessly by land and sea by the will of the gods, by cruel Juno's remorseless anger, long suffering also in war, until he founded a city and brought his gods to Latium. From that the Latin people came, the lords of Alba Longa, the walls of noble Rome. Muse, tell me the cause. How was she offended in her divinity? How was she grieved, the queen of heaven, to drive a man noted for virtue to endure such dangers, to face so many trials? Can there be such anger in the minds of the gods? 
Reference to Juno. Now, who's Juno? In the Greek pantheon, she's Hera. One of the three that was there back in the subtext of the Iliad, book 23, there were three gods. There was Hera, there was Aphrodite, and there was Athena. Athena. The Trojan, Paris, chose Aphrodite, right? Athena was offended. The Greeks invade. Here we have two of the three, three goddesses left. Af uh, Athena's out of the picture. Now we've got two goddesses here. Juno, where does Juno go? Well, Juno is the goddess that oversees... Nope. There it is. Get rid of it. These people, Carthage, the Carthaginian people worship her. I told you that the Trojans end up going to Rome. Who's the goddess that favors the Trojans? There were three goddesses, the Greeks, Athena, the Trojans, Aphrodite, the Carthaginians, Juno. So who's the god of the Romans? Aphrodite. Or known as here, not Aphrodite, known in Roman terms, Venus. So Venus, the, so we have the battle of the three goddesses carrying on here. And we're going to find that the Romans are connected with the goddess of love. And Virgil although he recognizes that they're, they're the main goddess of the Roman people is Juno, the goddess of love, he is going to find this deeply problematic because being connected to the goddess of love means giving way to the passions and not using your reason. And any people that wants to establish a civilization on the basis of anything other than reason, go back to Plato's Republic, is going to be doomed to be ruled by the lower elements of their nature and so prone to fire and destruction and give way to wrath and rage. And yes, they'll be a warlike people, but they will not be able to do what Augustus is claiming, which is to bring about a Pax Romana, which will stay in perpetual peace. Virgil's account of this is that Rome, because of the nature of the people and its goddess, given their, to the passions, is inevitably going to fall. So there's a critique in this. Um, and, and, and I want you, before I get back to the invocation here, I realize I'm jumping all over the place, but there's a lot here. I want you to read this story on two levels. On the one level, it's pretty straightforward. This is a poem dedicated to Augustus, Augustus who made Virgil the poet laureate of the day, the great poet everybody recognized, it's Virgil. He is the great poet of the day. He uh, is a great friend of Augustus Caesar. I want you to write me an epic. I want you to write me an epic about Rome, and I want you to celebrate the greatness of Rome, which means my greatness, basically. And you can see this because at the end of the story, Aeneas becomes a god. He's divinized. He gets taken up as a star into the heavens, we're told. It doesn't happen within the story. It happens. It's referred to in the story that it will happen after his death. He will become a god. Um, and therefore, his, his ancestors, namely Caesar Augustus, Augustus Caesar, will be, is also a god by dint of connection with, with uh, Aeneas through his son Julius, etc., etc., right? So in that sense, Aeneas, the hero of the story, is a prescriptive model for Augustus. This is how you are supposed to act. Be like Aeneas. So remember I said to you <coughs> in, the, uh, in the Odyssey that imitation of a role model of a hero was what epics seek to do. They try and get you to give you a role model. You, you behave like the hero in the story does. And we will see that um, in many ways Aeneas is such a role model. He, represent, he represents Roman virtues. And specifically one thing is cited. And where is that? I took black paper. Is this dry erase? OK. Um, his renown for his P 
pietas, his piety. He's called Pius Aeneas. Um, it's true that Odysseus was honored the gods, but he's not referred to as pious in, uh, Odysseus. He's referred to as wise Odysseus. He, he is uh, modeled after the goddess of Athena. Right? So he's, he's the wise Odysseus, regularly. Wisdom, wisdom is promoted in relation to Odysseus. In relation to Aeneas, though, it's repeatedly pious. And what do we mean by that? And you can see it right here in the beginning when he says that he is, it's by the will of the gods and he, and he brought his gods to Latium as well. It's very important he carries the household gods with him. And if you've ever seen, have you ever seen the movie Gladiator? The Russell Crowe movie from, I don't even know how long ago it was, 20 years ago? Great story. I mean, for a film, it's very well done. Because it has some elements that really would seem rather Roman. And one of them is his devotion to the household gods of hearth and home. He has the little figurines there. And he, he, it's important to him that he carries those with him. And they're mentioned in scripture as well, household gods. It's, they're, it's not uh, with favoritism, but they are mentioned. People have their household gods with them. It's a part of a pagan culture. You're revering your ancestors. That's what it is. You're revering your ancestors. So like in Chinese culture, there's ancestor worship going on. Same with the household gods. So he, he reveres the past. He reveres his forebears. Same in Korean culture, I understand. In fact, many cultures have the same dedication to the wisdom of the old. Our culture is the exact opposite. It's contempt for the wisdom of the ages, which is probably worse. Probably. <coughs> Um, that's not the point here. He is a man who is pious. Now, what does this mean? Uh, well, it means the subordination of his own desires to duty. What we have in Aeneas is a dutiful Roman man. He does his duty. In uh, Gladiator, when he's conquered the Germanic peoples, Maximus stands in front of the emperor of the day, and he says, I have one last order for you and he says you know stands up Caesar do your duty the soldier you tell me what to do and I'll do what you tell me I'm under orders I'm a, I'm a soldier that's the Roman model and what he will do to do this is deny himself this is not a story of a man who is a hero in his own eyes this is a man who will deny his own wishes to do what is right and this is the model for the Romans he's going to do it not for himself not even for his family, but for the glory of Rome. All for the greater cause. And for him particularly, it's uh, for his son, Julius, who's going to be the great figure however many hundreds of years later. Right? If, if he doesn't do this, Aeneas dies in Troy, which he wants to do. I want to go down with the city. I'm not, I don't want to carry on. But he does this because it's the pious thing to do. So he does his duty. And in this, he's the role model for Augustus Caesar. And let me say something about Virgil's thoughts on this. Virgil is a Stoic philosopher. You've heard of Stoicism. It's mentioned in Acts 17. The Stoics and the Epicureans and so forth. There's a dominant school of philosophy uh, in the post-Greek uh, period. And Stoics are renowned for seeking the good of the public. They often find themselves in political positions. So Cicero is a Stoic. Virgil is a Stoic. The great, men, most of the great Roman figures are Stoics. And with Stoicism, we associate one of the British virtues, which is the stiff upper lip. You know, a man hits you with a low blow. You look like the guy with the big black beef eater hat on, the red thing. You don't move a muscle. You look straight ahead. No sign that it's bothering you at all. You take the hits. You don't cry. Act like a man. Man up. No sign. Carry on. Do your duty. Don't show any emotion. Master yourself. Don't do it for yourself. Do it for the greater good. 
an army that's willing to set aside selfish interest for the sake of the common good does great things, right? And if you think it's just uh, incentive from uh, below, when the Roman armies lose in battle, they decimate their armies, which is what, they, you know what that means, to decimate? You've heard the word? They take every 10th man and execute him. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> One, two, three, every tenth man, down, your own army. Now, do you want to die in battle or do you want to be decimated? Because one way or the other, if you show cowardice, you're going to get decimated. This is an, a way of enforcing discipline. So this is the wonderful ideal. Oh, oh, and by the way, if you don't do it, you're going to be decimated. So watch out. Yes. Just random. They don't want to kill too many of them, but they want to make an example to the rest. It's got to be enough. We're not just going to kill one, because that's not enough of a threat. One out of every 10, that's a pretty serious threat. I mean, that's pretty possible that it's going to be you. Are you going to turn back in battle in that case? No, you are going to fight until you win. So they would only decimate them if they showed cowardice? Correct. Okay. They turn in battle, show cowardice, Watch out. No mercy. So there's the combination of duty and also you're going to do your duty and love duty. But on the other hand, if you don't love duty that much, we're going to encourage you to love duty a little bit more. <laughs> Stick you with the sword. <coughs> Harsh discipline. But that's military discipline. And that's how the Romans created this sort of, again, but the, that, that character of it, dispassionate or stoic facing of hardship is Roman virtue. And it is the men and the women. And here's the problem. In the Aeneid, we see repeatedly that Aeneas doesn't act this way. He keeps on giving, in, giving way to his passions. He falls in love with Dido. No, it is here. Here in Carthage. And she is the queen of the enemy. He falls in love with her. He wants to stay there. He lets his feelings get the best of him. And he's the role model. So the question is, if the great old Aeneas, the greatest hero that founded the city of Rome, is given, gives in to his passions like this, what chance does Augustus have? when we know that the great men lived in the past, not in our day. The greatest men that ever lived do not live in our day. They lived way back then. These are legendary figures. You might call yourself the great, but are you this great? Did you found a culture, a civilization? You're claiming it, but what is he like? So there's a, a sense here in which, although he lauds Aeneas and his character to Augustus, at the same time, he shows enough flaws in his character his hero to make us question whether it, uh, the eternal empire the, uh, under the Pax Romana can ever happen. So there's the idealistic portrait, don't do that, which will talk about a golden age. And it's the, world, it's the age of Caesar Augustus, the Pax Romana, eternal peace. All the battles have been fought. Roman virtue will hold forever. Roman justice. And on the other hand, there's this sense that that idea of a golden age is simply not going to happen. And why is that going to happen? Because even the gods don't observe this sort of justice. The story of the gods uh, going all the way back to uh, Jupiter's father, Saturn. Saturn was overthrown by his own son. Even the gods have always overthrown those in authority over them, even their own fathers. And Venus, who is, gives rise to the passions and to rage and jealousy and, and, and uh, captivity to lust, will eventually destroy the golden age. And the Roman people are made of such stuff. They're, they're the, their goddess is Juno after, or, or uh, Venus. 
How can they be stoic when they're so given to passion? Um, so that's the story. It's a complex hero, in other words. A very complex hero. And he's not very likable. Compared to Odysseus, compared to Achilles, this is a complex hero. Very complex. And, and so that's really interesting. Because you know he's the hero. You know he's going to do a great thing. He's all, if you're Roman, this is the great Aeneas. And what did he suffer to get to this point? Yes, but there's a lot to be critical of. And, and Virgil is, is very uh, quick to paint his vices as well as virtues. Do you have a comment or a question? Yes, it did. Yeah. So he's saying, here's what a role model ought to be like. But guess what? Uh, the Roman people are not like this. <laughs> you ought to be like this. I'm like this. Good men are like this. But the Roman people in general uh, do not hold to this view. The best of us do. But the worst of us, and that includes Aeneas, did not measure up to the Stoic ideal. Yes. It's popular. Yep. Yep. This is not, um, I mean, it's sort of difficult. It's, there's a bit of myth making going on here, but no, it's commonly like there's a pantheon of gods, right? So they, all, they worship all the gods, of course, but they are particularly appeal, they particularly appeal the Romans to Venus, which makes it really interesting when you look at later literature like when C.S. Lewis writes about Venus and voyage to Venus, and he, now you get all sorts of complexity, because then you're going to get the ide Christian ideas of love compared to Roman ideas of love, and so it becomes a rich, very rich tapestry at that point. But the idea that Augustus can get, bring peace to the world, how can he bring peace to the world when his body is at war with himself? His passions overrule his reason. At the end of the battle, at the end of the Iliad, we're not, or the Aeneid, we're not going to read this. Um, Aeneas gives way to rage and he stabs his foe, Turnus, in a deplorable way when he's down, asking for mercy. He s kills him. It's not the way you're, you want your heroes to act. But he's angry because he sees one of his friends, uh, something on his uh, chest which belonged to his friend, and he's so outraged that he, even though he's, he's on his knees begging for mercy, <laughs> puts the spear through him, kills him. Not very heroic, but that's Virgil's Aeneas. Have you mastered your own passions to that degree? So it's, it's sort of, yeah, okay, here's your hero, but you need to be better than that man, I guess you could say it as. So there's a great deal of ambiguity about the heroism of Aeneas. And, uh, and the idea of, of Eros in the poem, or the, the rule of Venus, is expressed as, as a very subversive force. Sexual desire, but also connected with rage and furor and destruction. The whole cities burn out of this rage. Your passions overruling your, your minds. Remember, Plato is crit criticizing this. Further comments or questions? If not, I'm going to put something up on the board here. Yeah. No? OK. So, have I got an eraser? I don't. Yes. Two seconds.
So there are different levels of uh, conflict here um, that I want you to make note of. And, uh, and I'm suggesting that one of the ways in which we can see this is a, it's, it's, a, it's a battle between fate, which is related to piety. The fate of Rome is that Julius Caesar, or just Julius, the son of Aeneas, will be the f a great forebear of Augustus. So be it's fated that the Roman people be great and conquer the whole of the known world. That's the fate. The piety of Aeneas is to hold to that fate. That's, so there's a conjunction of piety and fate together. And those things are for the good of all in the end. It's, it's peace, stability, whatever. Piety and, piety and fate need to work together. It's prophesied that this happened this way. So if you're going to be the great man, you have to do your duty, be pious to your ancestors, be pious to your son and the future, be pious towards Rome and do your duty. That's what's faded. On the other hand, you could give way to furor, rage, and that's represented by Carthage. It's represented by many things, actually. It's represented by Juno, who's very angry. She's very angry because she knows that Venus is going to beat her in the end. And she's the queen of heaven. She's Jupiter's consort. And yet Venus is going to beat her. And she is very unhappy about this. So it's the rage of Juno. Um, on a personal level, we'll see that Aeneas himself gives in to this. And therefore is marked by the Carthaginian weakness as much as anything. Um, We'll also see it in the narrative in relation to two figures. Uh, on the one hand, Dido, who gives in to a rage and takes her own life out of rage, and the city burns. But Dido burns, and then the city burns. And then Turnus, who is the commander of the forces in Italy. Uh, again, this whole battle is marked by rage. Um, and then the civil war that plays out of it. But there's a sort of a piety uh, on multiple fronts in conjunction with fate and furor, rage, t uh, tends to subvert all of these things. So don't give in to your passions. Hold yourself in check. Do what fate prescribes to do. This is ancient pagan pietism. Remember that Odysseus, Odysseus, Oedipus, made the great mistake of thinking that fate could be avoided. Fate cannot be avoided. It's a fatalistic world. If it's prophesied that it's going to happen this way, it's going to happen. And to be a good man is to do what's fated, even, even if you don't like it. 
It's a very different worldview than a Christian worldview. It's not based on moral conduct. Note, right? They don't believe the gods are good. They don't believe there is a god, but, they, but God is not good. The philosophers of the day might believe in good in some ways, but that's not what the gods are like. The gods are not good. They're not ruled by goodness. goodness. It's a very dark world. The gods are uh, who they are. They need to be revered. But don't think that you can please the gods by being good. You please the gods by doing what's the gods will, which is fate. It might actually be a very dark thing. It's certainly going to be self-denial. So Aeneas is going to represent all that. So this is a pious man who puts his own self-interest on the back burner in order to do his duty. He does this multiple times. He does it when he leaves Troy. He does it when he leaves Dido in Carthage. He does it when he lands in Latium and then battles. His whole life is about doing his duty against his own desires. Why? Because it's fated that he will found the great Rome of Augustus Caesar's day. So this is the model for Augustus. Don't do, you may be a god, but be like this man who didn't put himself first. So in, this, in that sense. On the other hand, this man, Aeneas, was given to all sorts of frailties, and what chance do you have, given that fact? So I think it's a very complex portrait. Let me go back to this narrative at the beginning. This was an invocation of the muse, and the muse is being, oops, I have to put this down. It's probably not going to let me bring it down now. Oh, it's turning off first. Oh, that was silly of me. Okay, well, I'll go to the text for a second. Boy, that's small print. Um, but I sing of arms and that. So the, it's a song, dactylic hexameter, and it's an epic. It invokes the muse to tell the story, and then the muse tells the story. So it's no longer Virgil that's speaking. It's the muse. It's a goddess connected to the fates, connected to memory, who's now going to tell the story that advances. It's a, this isn't any old story. This is a great story that's been inspired by the gods themselves. Let's see if I can try this again. I can, but, it, oh, there you go. It worked. Double click. Um, so having this, said this, he says, tell me the cause. How was she offended in her divinity? Who's she there? Juno. Yes. So the muses are the god. There are nine daughters of Nemosune, which means memory. So mummy is called mum memory, and she's got nine daughters, and the nine daughters are dedicated to specific branches of the arts. When I say the arts, it includes astronomy and so forth, and music and so forth, but there's a particular epic muse that is telling this story. And, it, and it's connected to memory. So it's not connected to invention. It's not connected to originality. It's, it's something telling something of the past. Note how the stories, the good old stories, are referring to something that's happened in the past that refer, relates to the present and equips us for the future, which is the way every culture actually works, until ours, until we have superheroes that have no connection to virtue, they just have powers, like Marvel superheroes. They have powers. And they're all orphans and stuff like that. Don't let me get down the... My critique of that will come later. We've got gods as well, but they're... Their parents are all dead, and they don't revere their cultures, and they have superpowers, don't you know, and whatever. They're not really role models at all. But they're cool and we can wear costumes and dress up for Halloween like them and whatever. Can you really develop those superpowers by imitation? Well, you can pretend you have web shooters, but it's not going to work for you. You can pretend to fly, but it's not going to work for you. Is there virtue being there held up as a model for you to follow? No. So what sort of heroes are they? Well, they've got superpowers. Okay, so what are we worshipping really? Power. That's it. Technology. Hmm. What does it teach kids? teaches them to worship technology and power. 
teaches them to be self-absorbed narcissists who worship technology and power. Sorry, can I look at my cell phone for a second? Oh, there we go. There you go. Why do you do what you do? Well, it's addictive. There's more than that. Right? There's more than that. Anyway, they're addictive. They are addictive. Tell me the reason. What's the cause? Was she offended in her divinity? How was she grieved, the queen of heaven, to drive a man noted, noted for virtue to endure such dangers, to face so many trials? Can there be such anger in the minds of the gods? Same sort of question that we had in the Odyssey. What made such rage? Well, it begins with a battle within the gods. There's a level of conflict. The first level is there's a fight amongst the divinities, and that prompts a fight down line, downstream, as it were. Human conflict arises from divine conflict. Now, I, I'm not going to do this here, but compare this to the uh, Christian view of how God does. God has no rivals. There's no conflict within the gods. There is only one God, and he is supreme. All the other gods are as nothing. They're idols. They're ne they have no power. Totally disarm them. That's not how the Romans see the world, or the Greeks see the world, or any of the pagan peoples, Babylonians, you name it. They're all the gods are in conflict, which means the nature of human life is perpetual conflict, which means that you should fight and defeat your enemies at all times, because who has might is right. That's not a Christian view. Because God, in his nature, creates things uh, good without conflict. Look at Genesis. I'm going to come to this text later on. Genesis, there's no conflict among the gods. There is only one. Creates everything orderly in peace. He calls it good. This is a very different story. So he has to explain where wars come from. It comes from the gods. That's where. If it comes from the gods, the Pax Romana is an impossibility. We can, you know, Caesar can have peace for a while, but the, if the gods are at war, what's Caesar going to do? No chance. Julius Caesar is not called Prince of Peace. Tell me the reason. Was she wounded in this way? How did he have such resentment? Well, here's the answer. There was an ancient city, Carthage, held by colonists from Tyre. Tyre is a... Uh, a little island off the coast of Israel. Opposite Italy, and the far off mouths of the Tiber, rich in wealth and very savage in pursuit of war. They say Juno loved this one land above all the others, Carthage. Even neglecting Samos, an island where they worshiped Juno. Here were her weapons and her chariot. Even then the goddess worked at and cherished the idea that it should have supremacy over the nations, if only the fates allowed. Note the caveat. If only the fates allow, well, the fates don't allow. Is Juno happy with the fates not allowing it? No. Is she going to fight against the fates? Yes, she is. Who's going to win? The fates. Juno does not have supreme power. She is angry. She can make a lot of a mess. But at the end of the day, the fates rule everything. Yet she'd heard of offspring derived from Trojan blood. By the way, the word Trojan related to Romans is related to Troy. That's their lineage, right? Of Trojan blood that would one day overthrow the Tyrian stronghold. And from them, a people would come, wild, wide ruling and proud in war to Libya's ruin. So the fates ordained. Fearing this and remembering the ancient war she had fought before at Troy for her dear Argos and the cause of her anger and bitter sorrows had not yet passed from her mind. The distant judgment of Paris stayed deep in her heart. The injury to her scorned beauty, refer back to the golden apple episode, right? Her hatred of the race and abducted Ganymede's honors. The daughter of Saturn, Incited further by this, sure, she's the daughter of Saturn. Her brother Jup Jupiter is her, never mind. Uh, incited further by this, hurled the Trojans, the Greeks, and pitiless Achilles had left round the whole ocean, keeping them far from Latium. They wandered for many years, driven by fate over all the seas. Such an effort it was to found the Roman people. They were hardly out of sight of Sicily's isle in deeper waters joyfully spreading sail bronze keel plowing the brine when juno nursing the eternal wound in her breast spoke to herself note that she 
nurses a wound, she can't get over it. She's ruled by her passions, even Juno. Spoke to herself, am I to abandon my purpose? Conquered, unable to turn the toy Korean king away from Italy. Why, the fates forbid it. Wasn't Pallas, Athena, able to burn the Argive fleet to sink it in the sea because of the guilt and madness of one man, Ajax, son of Oileus? She herself hurled Jupiter's swift fire from the clouds, scattered the ships, and made the sea boil with storms. She caught him up in a water spout as he breathed flame from his pierced chest and pinned him to a sharp rock. Yet I, who walk about as queen of the gods, wife and sister of Jove, wage war on a whole race for so many years. Indeed, will anyone worship Juno's power from now on or place offerings humbly on her altars? So what initiates the conflict here is the anger of Juno. Why is she angry? Because one man said she wasn't the most beautiful. A man, it wasn't even one of the gods. A man said, no, it's Aphrodite. Uh-oh, so she's angry and she's still angry and she's not gonna stop being angry. And worse than this, if she lets them get away with it, will anybody worship her going forward? So I have to carry on with this. So she's committed irrationally to fight against fate forever. Now she's connected with the Carthaginians. And so she asks for help. Who does she ask for help? God of the winds, Aeolus. Blow, blow him off course. Goes to King Aeolus, the writhing winds, let him out, he's sleeping, and he blows. And the all-powerful father, Juno, or Jupiter rather, fearing this, hid them in the dark caves and piled them up, and Juno speaks to him, Aeolus, since the father of gods and king of men gave you the power to quell and raise the waves with the winds, there is a people I hate sailing the Tyrrhenian Sea, bringing Troy's conquered gods to Italy. Add power to the winds and sink their wrecked boats. So a lot like Neptune in the Odyssey, right? A lot like Neptune. Or drive them apart and scatter their bodies over the sea. I have, well, okay, here's the order, but here's the enticement. I have 14 nymphs of outstanding beauty of whom I'll name Deopea, the loveliest in looks, joined in eternal marriage and yours forever. So that for such service to me as yours, she'll spend all her years with you and make you the father of lovely children. The god of the winds replied, your task, O queen, is to decide what you wish. My duty is to fulfill your orders. You brought about all this kingdom of mine, the scepter, Jove's favor. You gave me a seat at the feasts of the gods and you made me lord of the storms and tempests. So he raises a storm and with that storm causes a potential shipwreck, and then Neptune intervenes. So now the gods are battling amongst the other over what happens on Earth. So note that, the, that there's a god behind the action that motivates the whole action, just like in uh, Homer's account. It's, it's easy to overlook because we're focused on the human actors, but they believe that the gods are behind all human wars. And because the world is fundamentally connected with a fatalistic worldview, but also committed to war. War cannot be avoided. And what will dis be decided at the end of the day of what is the right way to rule will just simply, well, who's going to win the fight? Who's strongest? Yes? Aren't we as Christians also held to a fatalistic worldview? No. the dispensationalist take on Christian theology. I don't think so. No, I don't think so. And, and fate is a blind thing. Remember, fates are blind. There's no, the, the providence of God and the prophecy about what will happen in the future is not blind. It's simply that God is in control of human history. It's not quite the same as fate, and it's certainly not disconnected from virtue or goodness because God is good. Whereas here, the gods and fate have nothing to do with goodness. It's just blind fate and it can be totally disconnected from it we might value virtue but what do the gods care about virtue so it's not the same and there's a difference between providence and god's uh mastery over human history and what they mean here by fate it's not the same thing at all um anyway but that's a big topic and 
tough one to answer right at the end of the talk. I'll stop for now. Um, 